so that we and so that if anyone does not want to be recorded to please turn off your camera again that is to let you know you're being recorded and we will start in just a few minutes And I'll be checking that and admitting other people in as um, as we get started, but let's go ahead and welcome to our fifth and final day of our 11th annual NOLA ILC Information Literacy Forum. This is our fourth online conference. And again, everyone who's been here throughout the week, or even if this is your first day tuning in, thank you so much for coming. My name is Alicia Schwarzenbach, and I am the chair of NOLA ILC Executive Board. Our chat monitor today is a NOLA, exec, NOLA ILC Executive Board member, Caitlin Barodi. So um, as I mentioned, uh, we are recording. So again, if you do not want to be recorded, just don't turn on your camera. But we wanna start by acknowledging the original inhabitants of this land. The city of New Orleans is a continuation of an indigenous trade hub on the Mississippi River, known for thousands of years as Bobanka, a Choctaw term meaning place of many tongues. Native peoples have lived on this land since time immemorial and the resilient voices of Native Americans remain an inseparable part of our local culture. The New Orleans Information Literacy Collective would not only like to acknowledge and honor the indigenous people of this land, but we encourage our executive board, presenters, and attendees to shift their approach to land acknowledgements and consider meaningful activities and reparative actions to support Native communities. We ask that over the course of the forum this week that you reflect and carry out an actionable item. You might consider aiding nations in recovering and controlling their rightful homelands through native-led organizations, such as the Indian Land Tenure Foundation, support and petition on behalf of local tribes and achieving federal recognition. Many tribes in Louisiana, like the United Homa Nation and Louisiana Band of Choctaw, have state recognition, but not federal, which strengthens the tribe's fight for land sovereignty. Follow on social media and or donate to organizations like Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women USA or the Association of American Indians Affairs Repatriation Project, which works to return ancestral remains and sacred objects to their original nations. These are just a few recommendations by, by no means do they encompass all the ways in which you can support Native communities. We encourage you to continue learning and participating as we aim to avoid performativity and work to be an equitable and inclusive of all. A link to this land acknowledgement with a list of resources to the items mentioned above can be found in the footer of the NOLA ILC website We'll provide a direct link to the list in the chat, and it is also included on our link tree, so you can't miss it, um, and it has all those links available. So a few housekeeping matters. The two presenters today will each speak for half an hour, after which we'll have questions from attendees. You can type your questions into the chat box at any time, and our chat moderator will keep track of them for the Q&A session afterwards. You can also use the chat box to let us know about any tech problems that may be originating uh, possibly on our end. And finally, in the chat box, you should see all those links that I've just put mentioned. 
including a survey. Please, if we will also put it at the end, but it is important to us to find out your responses and uh, anything that you are interested in and what you thought of what we are done. Today, we're honored to welcome Emily Buffert presenting One Shot Class, Making Memorable Handouts, and Daniel DuPont with So You Just Served the Man, Misgendering and You. During her third week working in a library, Emily knew, quote, this is where I belong, end quote. Earlier in her career, she enjoyed teaching as an adjunct professor at UNO and as the Learning Commons Coordinator for Loyola University of New Orleans. When the pandemic hit, she picked up the study torch with Florida State University and graduated with her Master of Science in Information with a graduate certificate in youth services. She now serves New Orleans students as the first year experienced librarian with Xavier University of Louisiana. And one day she wants to give back to the university community of students by teaching some aspect of library sciences later in her career. Thank you, Emily. And we're ready to hear. Good morning, everybody. Good so, morning. Yeah, thank you. My presentation today is going to be interactive. So I am going to use a technology called Nearpod. Uh, it's an online sort of like learning environment. Uh, so what I'm going to ask you to do is go ahead and open a web browser. And I am going to share my screen. And you're going to go to the URL join.nearpod.com and enter this code and that will bring you to the online learning environment. So everybody just kind of get in there. I'm gonna figure out, let's see, there we go. And the code will stay at the top. So if people come in a little late, they can join. Okay. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and close this. So welcome to One Shot Class, Making Memorable Handouts by Emily Bufford. Um, I have my BA in English with a concentration in creative writing. I have a Master of Fine Arts in creative writing. My also my Master of Science in Information. And as was mentioned, I'm the first year experienced librarian here at Xavier University of Louisiana, the only Catholic HBCU in the, in the country. So I want us to first say hello like a local. Is there a unique way to say hello from your city, state, or country? Let's see it in the chat. So I am from New Orleans. Uh, so I, I say hi's your mama and them. Um, but if you have a unique way of saying good morning or hello, I encourage you to share that in the chat. Let's see. Um, okay. All right, so let's move on. So what aquatic feature do you feel like today? Do you feel ready to rock, to rip to ready to rock like a riptide, just chilling jellyfish, sleepy starfish? Uh, do you feel like um, a just chilling jellyfish, a sleepy starfish, an excited anemone, a riled up hurricane, or you know, pick one? and we'll kind of see how everybody's feeling. Emily, I think we need a code for the Nearpod. Um, yeah, it's at the top there. You can see right here, the E-R-E-9-R-4-Q. Oh, e so uh, if you go to join.nearpod.com, it, uh, it will switch. You can just put in the code and then they can join in. 
Okay, so we have some sleepy starfishes, just chilling jellyfishes, ready to rock riptides. Oops. Oh, don't know what that was. Uh oh. Yeah, resume. Sorry. <laughs> that was by fault. Okay. So let's switch to teacher view. Okay, so just chilling jellyfish seems to be the most popular. Awesome. Excited and enemy. I like that. I was, this is pretty hard to actually come up with um, aquatic features that had emotions. Um, route up hurricane. Very good. Okay. So, all right. So let's talk about handouts. Um, first, we're going to cover sort of the common formats that they come in, the common uses that people uh, use them for, and then the potential uses that we would like to see. So first of all, some the most common handout formats. So they're going to be eight and a half by 11 if you're doing physical handouts, right? Because most educators only have access to standard printers. So eight and a half by 11 will be the most frequent size. You may see smaller than eight and a half by 11, um, but not usually because uh, you need to fit all the things on there. Uh, and then there will be slides. So maybe not so much in the education world, but in the business world, many presenters will choose to simply print a thick stack of paper featuring their slides with areas for notation. So it'll just be like four slides per page and then like lines underneath each box so that you can write in your own notes. And many physical copies given out, especially printed slides, are not carefully crafted for content. So they merely repeat what was said inside of the presentation. Um, and that's especially important if you just print, you know, and especially uh, prominent if you just print out the slides. So how are handouts used? So when you actually give a handout into someone's hand, what does a student do with it? Uh, sadly, most physical copies given during a presentation wind up in the garbage or at least the recycling bin. Um, a little bit, a step above that is there will be guilt or a false sense of hope uh, that may keep the physical paper around, but really it will never be utilized again and eventually winds up in the trash. And then the last use is the best, uh, where particularly studious or invested students will keep a printout for future use when needed. So they'll actually keep it with them and bring it back out of the backpack when they need it. So how could handouts be used? So what is something that a handout could potentially do for the student? So one thing is, the first thing is notes. It provides pre-written notes so students can focus on the presentation and have an accurate depiction of a complex topic. So oftentimes we think of people, you know, taking notes during a presentation, but that causes a split uh, sort of attention and it can actually damage the way that they're receiving the information because you can't write words and listen to words at the same time. So by providing a handout, you're sort of providing the notes that way they don't have to take them. Um, and it also will be a more accurate depiction, like I said, because their attention won't be split. It can also, a handout can also be an up close view. So it provides an up close look at a particularly confusing or complex visual not fit for a presentation slide or whiteboard. So sometimes on a presentation slide, if you have something that's really intricate, uh, it can be difficult to sort of put it up there, especially like um, if you're doing say spreadsheets or something along those lines, it can be really difficult to read those from afar. So you could put those on a handout to give to the students so that they can actually look at it at their desks. And then beyond that, there's a, this would provide a deeper explanation to complex topics that can only be glossed over in a presentation, but students can study later. So some things, you know, as educators, we may only have so much time, right? We only have so many minutes to um, sort of share what we've got. And sometimes we can't get to those really complex topics completely and thoroughly but you could create a handout that thoroughly explains it and give it to them and refer them to it and say, when you need it later, just ask for it. Okay, so this is um, where I want you to share the best handouts uh, that you have seen. So if you could describe a great handout you've seen, that would be lovely. And I think,
short URLs like Bitly, flowchart for where to go for certain library related needs. Oh, I like flowcharts, love them. Big headings with bullet points, visual centered with text to the side all around. That would be a cool way to do it, yeah. Bookmarks with info on them. I only like bookmarks. Yeah, bookmarks are good though. I mean, and the, they're especially, they're very passive um, and they get used, so they're really good. Okay, so let's go to the next one. All right, so now we're gonna talk about five strategies to use when creating handouts um, so that they are sort of the punchiest and liveliest that they can be, and they also deliver an appropriate amount of information. So let's see what we've got here. So we've got focus, eyes, fonts, cues, and color. So the first strategy is focus. You, If you're doing a 30 minute, or an uh, hour or an hour and 15 minute uh, presentation, you cannot fit all of that on an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. It's just not possible. Uh, so it's important to focus on a difficult to explain or remember concept. That could be your choice. So for instance, um, I use a handout when I do Boolean operators because there's no way that they're going to remember even necessarily how to spell Boolean or what the word was. So we can sort of gloss over it during the presentation and then they have the handout to take with them. And the next time they use a search, they can refer to the handout. Uh, it could be the most important topic, whatever you deem as being the thing that they have to remember or the idea that lends itself to visual representation best. So like I said, like we were talking about earlier, it could be that um, it's some sort of graph or spreadsheet type thing where it really lends itself to visual representation well. And the reason why that you wanna focus is to respect learner's cognitive load. So a cognitive load is the ability for the brain to go from working memory to long-term memory, and it can only handle so much at once. Um, so you just wanna respect that, that load that they can handle and maybe take some of the load and add it to a handout. That way they can just you know, sort of refer to it later. Okay, the second strategy is eye fatigue. So when you're looking at a website or you're looking at a handout or anything else, your eyes kind of need guidance where to go first. And so I really liked that someone said that they had a handout that they saw that had an image in the middle with all the words around because it lets your eyes know to focus on that image. And I think that's very interesting. And then you can go to the words around it, but the image probably spoke a lot toward what the handout was about. Um, it's also good to sort of do it in bite-sized chunks. So not like one solid page of text, but rather like break it up so that there's white space for the eyes to rest. You can use lines, vertical or <clears throat> horizontal um, to sort of separate the different chunks. And also color boxes can really highlight a chunk to make it look more important than the others. And generally you just wanna avoid clutter um, because it can make the mess, the handout look messy or overly strenuous to the eyes. Okay, so three is fonts. So always use 12 point or larger for the really important information. Um, and then maximum, you wanna use two easy to read fonts. Keep one font for titles and headlines and then one font for the real information part. Also for people who are dyslexic, or have other kind of reading difficulties, non-serif fonts. So that's the ones without the little ticks on the bottom and the top. Um, those are actually easier to read and accessible. And then four is visual cues. So there's this idea in psychology called cued recall. And what cued recall means is that when you see an image with content, and then you see the image again later, it's easier to recall the content. So if you're doing a, like a slide presentation and you're doing a handout, reuse the visuals, the fonts and the colors from the presentation on the handout. Uh, that way you're sparking cued recall in the viewer's brain. So you'll see that my, I made a handout for the handouts, getting a little meta, uh, but I have a, a palm tree on it. 
and then five colors. So we always have to think about colors. If you can't print in color, then you're only thinking in grayscale, which is okay. Uh, but if you have the opportunity to print in color, I encourage it. Black and white for physical handouts are obviously going to be your go-tos because the paper is going to more than likely be white and the ink for the most part will be black. But I encourage you to pick complementary colors that are high interest, but not overstimulating. So no more than four colors should be used, black and white, and then two complementary colors. Okay, so for the next slide, we're gonna start this activity. Um, this activity is basically gonna show you a really messy handout. And what I encourage you to do is to make suggestions based on the five strategies we just talked about on how to improve it. All right, so I see some line drawing. Yeah, you can um, use the TT at the bottom is, is for putting text onto it, or you can draw, or you can actually add images as well. Right, so we've got some circles going on with some directives center the headings, right? Too small. Yeah, some of that text gets really tiny. Okay, let's see, we got some other stuff. Oh, I see a red, add white space. I see a big red ellipse. Okay, so let's see, all of that should be moved up. Use bold to break up the text. That's good, I like that answer. change to a chart. Interesting suggestion. Turn these into left alignment heading. Pharmacy should be right below arts, music, theology, right. So they could be left aligned, just like the paragraph on the left. Okay, awesome. Font is too small and needs spaces between lines. Yeah, to give those eyes a rest. Let's see, what else? Okay, so put in boxes. And then we've got, why are these different sizes? I guess it was just uh, to make it fit. <laughs> Too small, let's see. So many fonts, right? I'm glad somebody noticed that. There are so many fonts on this. And um, most of them, especially the heading ones are serif fonts, which are not uh, dyslexia friendly. Okay, so just submit when you feel like you've made all of your corrections all need to be the same size, right? That would be nice for all the information text to sort of be the same size. What do you think about eliminating some of this? What would you say about eliminate less info? Okay, yeah, I just saw less info, right? So eliminating a lot of what it says um, to focus, right? To really bring in that focus, good. Yeah, so narrow the number of databases, reduce the number of uh, brief descriptions, right? So maybe get rid of those, right? How can students act access these databases from a piece of paper? So that's a question. There's no QR codes, sort of like get, leading them to a database page. Right, so change the fonts. Okay, so bullet points or a chart. Move some text onto the back of the sheet. Very interesting idea, yeah. So you can print, print front and back and save paper, but still have lots of information. Okay, so that was, let's see. 
I'm trying to read this very tiny, not enough contrast, right? So the black on the dark gray is a little hard to read. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and move on. So I think y'all, first of all, I just wanna say y'all did an excellent job. This was a complete mess of a handout. Um, that I actually did start to try to make something and the end result was completely different. So I do want to touch on if you make a handout and you are really positive that it's fantastic and you feel like, oh, I've got to share this with everybody. Here's the thing, in order to protect what you've done and in order to make people comfortable with sharing it, you really need to put a Creative Commons license on it. Um, and so you'll notice I made a, a website to accompany this particular uh, presentation. And you'll notice on there, I have some handouts that you guys can start to use if you want to, but each of the handouts has this license on the bottom of it, which says this work is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial 4.0 International License. So if you have a copy of this license, visit this URL or send a letter to this address. And then I, at the very end, I put created by Emily Bufford. That way the attribution can be made to me. Um, and you should be able to click on those orange letters, uh, creativecommons.org to open up the Creative Commons page. Um, I'm not like saying that I'm an expert at Creative Commons, but I do know that if you want to share it out into public spaces, it's a good idea for you and for the viewers to both see a Creative Commons license. And then here are my references. Um, so these are just the things you know that I sort of drew from to create this presentation. And you can see the last one is the creativecommons.org. Um, and I actually use Canva. I think a lot of people are fans of that. So this is my email address, ebuffered at zula.edu. Again, I am the first year experienced librarian here at Xavier. And I wanted to say thank you. And then if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat to be monitored. And finally, like I said, I have a resources web page. So I actually created um, a web page that has like the slides on it, that has some handouts that you can use today on it, that you can just download and print. Um, and so if you, you can either put in the tiny URL or you can actually click on the click here button. And it will bring you to that website. And I actually have it pulled up right here. So the website has a survey. If you would like to do that for me to let me know what you learned and how well I did. And then it has the slides, a handout about handout, handouts, handouts, um, the use now handouts that you could take into a uh, classroom. Then the references, and finally, if you wanted to see that poor sad example again, there it is. So I hope you all enjoyed, and thank you for for coming in and and joining us today. Hello, Emily. That was really cool. I've never seen um that uh system of presentation. Um, so Nearpod is definitely something to check out. Um, I really liked that. And I think we're going to get some information. I did put the link there. So hopefully people might take some time to give you feedback on your um, site. And now we're going to move along. Um, so uh, next we have Daniel DuPont with so you just third the ma'am, misgendering and you. Daniel's bio reads, I strive to make the library a place that is open and welcoming to all. It's a content process of engagement, success, failure, and education. I live in New Orleans, Louisiana with three cat children and one human child. Hello, Danny, and welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Let me go ahead and start sharing my screen. Oh, actually, give me just a second, because I, there we go. Now I can share my screen.
Okay, everybody seeing that? With Canva, so you just heard the man misgendering in you? Yes, we can see it. Okay, perfect. Now I'm gonna turn off my video because I look weird when I'm talking but not paying attention. Um, so I wanna thank you for joining me this morning. I wanna thank the ILC for having me, um, for all of you for being here. Um, I'm going to make all of these slides available. Um, I, I have the, the Creative Commons license down here. Um, all of these slides are going to be available. I also have a website that I'm going to give you the link to at the end, and I also have a QR code. Um, so everything that Emily talked about. So this is the our real uh, uh, title here. So you just served the ma'am. Our real title card is Gendering in You. I'm Daniel DuPont. I'm a librarian and assistant professor at uh, Delgado Community College. Give me just a second. I'm going to move this weird little Zoom bar that I have. It's sort of in my way. There we go. So um, I'm going to talk today about uh, why you should make the effort to get pronouns right, how you can avoid misgendering patrons, and the big one, what do you get it wrong? Um, I based the topic of this presentation on Our Flag Means Death, which I'm sort of obsessed with. Uh, it's uh, a show, it's a comedy show that was on HBO Max um, with gay, trans, queer pirates. Everybody was sort of like on the LGBTQ uh, spectrum. It was just a really great, had very uh, good representation. Just a really good show. Um, I want to explain the title real quick. Um, it is, I say it's homage, not plagiarism. There was a really good website many years ago called The Toast. Um, it now no longer exists, but there was a uh, post on there called, you just went full sir on the ma'am, how to apologize for misgendering someone. And I was creating this presentation and could not come up with a name. And I was two days late submitting it the first time I was going to do it. And I stole the name. So you just served the ma'am. Um, but I, I always try to give The Toast credit. So you may think that based on the topic of this presentation, that I am trans, and you would be correct. That is true. But I'm going to ask for your compassion and empathy throughout this presentation because it's pretty difficult to lay yourself bare in front of others, you know? Every time I do this presentation, I am coming out to people. So I appreciate your empathy. So real quick, I'll, often I do this presentation for people I already know. But real quick, since I many of you I don't know already, as I said, I'm a librarian and assistant professor at Delgado. Um, I research best practices for LGBTQ plus populations in libraries and in higher education. Um, I research and develop best practices for digital accessibility. I have three cat children, one and one human child. I have an uncanny knack for being really annoying about niche media, such as Our Flag Means Death. And I'm trying to read 200 books this year. I think I'm going to make it. I'm about at 105, I think. So what is misgendering? So misgender means to refer to someone, especially a transgender person, using a word, pronoun, or form of address that does not correctly reflect their gender. Um, examples are using he, him pronouns for someone who uses they, them, calling a trans woman sir, referring to a trans man as Mrs. Teach. Um, dead name means to call a transgender person by their birth name when they've changed their name as part of their gender transition. They may have legally changed their, their name. They may not have. It may just be something informal. It's still very serious. That's why they call it a dead name. It's not their birth name anymore. It's their dead name because it is that serious. Um, gender transition, it's the process of shifting gender roles. Um, different from that assigned at birth, there's social transition, which is changing names, pronouns, and clothing. For instance, I have legally changed my name. Um, I uh, use different pronouns from those that I used when I was growing up, and I wear men's clothing. Medical transition includes hormone therapy and surgery. There's many different kinds of uh, surgeries. There, there's a whole range of hormone therapies. Um, and some people medical tra medically transition. They don't socially transition. Some people socially transition, never medically transition. Transitioning is not required to be transgender. A person may identify as transgender, but never socially or medically transition. So we're going to talk a little bit about the science. Um, these are two characters here over in this, this GIF here. 
um, from Our Flag Means Death. This is Jim and Frenchie. And Frenchie's saying, no, it's science because women have crystals in their body and the crystals attract demons. And that's why you can't have a woman on a ship. And Jim's saying that's a myth. And I'd like to tell people that I had to have my crystals removed when I transitioned. Um, so trans, if you're not completely sure what trans means, it's anyone whose gender identity refers from the sex they were assigned at birth. Non-binary is when gender identity and or gender expression fall outside the gender binary. Other terms include agender, gender fluid, gender queer. There's many, many more. Um, cisgender is anyone whose gender identity is aligned with the sex they were assigned at birth. And um, assigned at birth is just the sex that an infant uh, is assigned based on external characteristics. That's really important, the external characteristics. Um, AFAB, AFAB, assigned female at birth. AMAB, assigned male at birth. Um, about one in 2,000 babies is born with ambiguous genitalia. Um, that's a lot of babies that are born with ambiguous genitalia. About 1.7% of the population falls outside of the XX or XY binary. That's about the same as the percentage of natural redheads. So that's uh, people who are born with, uh, you know, maybe one uh, sex chromosome, or they're born with three, or sometimes people are born with two X chromosomes, but part of the X is missing. I used to babysit a little girl who we didn't know until she was almost grown that she had three X chromosomes. It's a lot more common than you think. Um, so when people talk about, oh, it's science, you know, you're either XX or XY. That's just not true. The science is that it's a lot more complicated. Um, gender identity and expression. Identity is a deeply held knowledge of one's own gender. And expression is the outward signifiers of a gender. Of gender gender non-conforming is someone whose gender expression, but not their identity, differs from conventional ex expectations of masculinity and femininity. So someone may be gender non-conforming, but still be cisgender, like a man may wear uh, eyeliner or paint his fingernails, but he still considers himself to be a cisgender man. So why should you make the effort to get pronouns right? And it is effort. It does take work. And this is Nana, um, Jim, uh, Jim's grandmother from Our Flag Means Death. Jim is a non-binary actor, or is, is played by a non-binary actor, Vico Ortiz. And Jim is a non-binary character. And here, Nana does not know that Jim has changed their name and dead names them and Jim's and Jim's like, no, I go by Jim these days. And Nana is the MVP says, well, come in, Jim, we'll have cake. And Nana just rolls with it like that. Love, love Nana. Um, so why does it matter? Why should you make the effort to get someone's pronouns right? So we're going to talk about some really sad kind of heavy stuff right now. Um, in, 20, in a 2022 survey of over 28,000 LGBTQ plus um, youth ages 13 to 24, including uh, over 14,500 transgender and non-binary youth, half trans and non-binary youth considered suicide in the past year. Beyond LGBTQ plus youth, that number is only about one in five. I say only, um, no amount is okay, but half ah, trans and non-binary youth, half considered suicide. Um, when you look at still 20, you're looking at beyond LGBT, LGBTQ plus youth, the number is still 20%. That's a lot, but half of trans and non-binary youth considered suicide. Nearly one in five trans and non-binary youth attempted suicide. So nearly 20%. If we look at all youths in the range, it's only 9%. LGBTQ plus youth of color reported higher rates than their white peers. Um, and it's important to note that this number is only attempts. That's only um, suicidal ideation and uh, attempts at suicide. It is not, um, he, it's not youth who have managed to complete suicide because nobody is keeping track of those numbers. Um, only 35% of trans and non-binary youth found their home to be gender affirming. Just over half of trans and non-binary youth found their school to be gender affirming. Nearly 75% of trans and non-binary youth reported experiencing symptoms of anxiety. More than 60% of trans and non-binary youth reported experiencing symptoms of depression. 56% of LGBTQ plus youth who wanted mental health care in the past year were not able to get it. 
Reasons cited for being unable to access mental health care include they didn't want to ask their parents permission or receive virtual care at home. Um, they were afraid of not being taken seriously or looking weak. They were afraid of being outed or their parents refused. They told their parents, I am feeling some kind of way. I'm feeling anxious. I'm feeling depressed. I'm feeling like maybe I want to kill myself. And their parents said, no, no, you're not. No, no, you don't. You don't. We don't need to worry about that. Don't worry about it. I cannot imagine. I cannot imagine these children going through this. And no surprise, it's worse for POC youth. 11% of white LGBTQ plus youth attempted suicide in 2021 compared to, I'm sorry, that's 2022. I didn't update that number. 2022 compared to 22% of native and indigenous youth, 18% of Middle Eastern North African youth, 16% of black youth, 17% of multiracial youth, 15% of Latin youth, and 10% of Asian American Pacific Islander youth. And the world is not kind to trans poll. Um, 27% of transgender non-binary youth reported being physically threatened or harmed because of their gender identity. A 2021 study found that transgender people ages 16 and over were more than four times as likely as cisgender people to be the victims of violent crime. 8.61% of trans women were victims of violence versus 2.37% of cis women. 10.8% uh, of trans men were victims of violence versus 1.98% of cis men. The only reason I can figure for the number of trans men being more like the higher percentage of trans men being victims of violence versus trans women is that the uh, trans men are getting it both ways. They're being uh, perceived as trans, but they're also being perceived as, as cis women by some people um, because trans women have it rough, especially black trans women. It's really hard out there for trans women. Um, trans, trans households had higher rates of property victimization in cis households. Um, a 2022 study found that trans youth ages 14 to 16 were more than twice as likely as cis peers to experience sexual violence. They were no more likely than their peers to commit sexual violence. And it can often feel like the government is out to get us. 65% um, of youth on gender affirming hormones were afraid of losing access to care. Nearly one in three LGBTQ plus youth said anti LGBTQ plus policies and legislation negative, negative impacted mental health. Nearly two in three LGBTQ plus youth said potential legislation banning discussion of LGBTQ plus people at school made their mental health much worse. I am an entire adult with great health insurance, and I still experience anxiety of being, about being able to access health care. 79% of LGBTQ plus youth said potential legislation banning conversion therapy positively affected their mental health, though. So that's good. Um, in 2017, the Justice Department said it would not stand up in court for trans people, indicating that it was cool to discriminate based on trans identity. This has obviously changed with the new administration, with the Biden administration, but it was still a scary time. Um, until June 2020, the law was still murky on whether an employer could fire someone for being trans. Um, in, 20, in June 2020, the Supreme Court ruled federal employment law does, in fact, protect trans people. Until, until then, it was just sort of like, eh, who knows? Um, that was in June 2020. I uh, came out and began transitioning in November of 2020. Um, I, I didn't think my employer would fire me, but it was just sort of like, mm, I, can't, I didn't want to take the chance. So here, here's some current Louisiana legislation. Um, HB 648 would ban gender affirming care for minors. Um, HB 466, the Don't Say Gay Trans Queer Bill, would ban the discussion discussion of sexual orientation or gender identity in schools, it would force schools to misgender trans students except with parental consent, and it would allow public school employees to misgender students if it is contrary to religious or moral convictions. Um, HB 81 would allow school officials to use, I don't know why that is, uh, why that's bolded, to use birth name and pronouns except with uh, parental consent. It would allow public school employees to deny misgender students if it is contrary to religious moral convictions. And it affects anyone who uses a nickname different than their birth name. So if somebody is named Michael and goes by Mike, um, they, they would need uh, parental consent to be called Mike. Um, these are live bills. They are expected to be vetoed though. 
Um, these two have gone through. These affect library censorship and oversight. Act 436 create collection development community standard, implements a new library card system, potentially defunds libraries that fail to comply. It was signed by the governor June 28th, and it is effective August 1st. Um, Act 359 allows uh, the Parish Council to add members to the Livingston Parish Library Board of Control, which was signed June 12th and is effective August 1st. Um, so there's also just a lot of anti-LGBTQ plus legislation in the news. We hear it um, beyond just what's happening in Louisiana. We hear the regional and national news. In 2023, there have been at least 520 anti-LGBTQ plus bills introduced at the state level in the U.S. across the country. 220 plus bills would restrict the rights of transgender people. This is the most of our anti-trans legislation in a single year, and we're only halfway through the year. Um, 125 plus gender affirming care bans, 14 have become law, um, 30 plus anti-trans bathroom bills, 100 plus anti-LGBTQ plus curriculum censorship bills. Some of those are at the, uh, the higher ed level, which blows my mind. 45 anti-LGBTQ plus drag performance bills. So that's a lot of angst. That's a lot just hearing about it, even if it's not directly affecting us, just hearing about it can really negatively impact me mental health. So what can we do to make things better? Um, LGBTQ plus young people who have access to affirming homes, schools, community events, reported lower rates of attempting suicide. So creating affirming spaces for young people will really make a difference to their mental health. Affirming gender identity um, among transgender and non-binary youth is consistently associated with lower rates of attempted suicide. Just making sure to get those pronouns right, to get their names right is that's going to uh, lower rates of attempted suicide. Topics that um, LGBTQ youth report wanting people in their lives to learn more about, gender identity, sexual orientations, pronouns, which is what we're going to talk about more in a minute, um, the gender binary, microaggressions, racism, intersectionality. Um, these are things that they want us to learn more about so that we can understand more what's going on with them and um, create safer spaces for them. So that was rough. That was a rough thing to talk about. Um, we're going to shake out some of the bad vibes and we're going to talk about how we can do better. How can we avoid misgendering patrons, students, um, or anyone, just anyone in, in, that we come in contact with? Um, and here's Jim saying, it's very simple. You all know me as Jim. Just keep calling me Jim. Nothing's changed. It's just really easy. So how can you avoid misgendering patrons? Really simple. Don't challenge someone's identity. Avoid use of sir and ma'am. Don't refer to patrons as male or female. And use singular they when you don't know someone's gender. Um, I know that for a lot of us, um, especially in the South, using sir and ma'am is seen as manners. Um, I got this from Emily Post. It is essential to good etiquette to call people what they want to be called. Um, and this was about using sir and ma'am and using correct pronouns specifically. So even Emily Post says it's okay not to say sir and ma'am. Um, once we know someone's gender, sure. But when you're just meeting somebody for the first time and you don't know their gender, don't use any gendered language for them. And these are my words to live by. Um, right here over, over Blackbeard. What I should have said was nothing. I could have saved myself so much trouble in life if I just said nothing. So here's some simple do's and don'ts. Um, this, this first one happens to me a lot. You don't look or sound like an Edward. Accept a patron's identity. If you need to confirm they're who they say, use other information such as phone number, home address, or birth date. Don't just keep saying, but, but you don't look like an Edward. Um, May I speak to, don't say, may I speak to Mr. Teach? Say, may, may I speak to Edward Teach? May I speak to Edward? Um, how can I help you, ma'am? How can I help you? Um, it's in an email or a letter, instead of dear sir or ma'am, dear, dear Mrs. Teach, you can say hello, good morning, good afternoon. Um, don't say excuse me, sir. You can say excuse me. Now, I know that like, excuse me, sir, excuse me, ma'am. We like the beats of that. Like, excuse me, sir. Saying excuse me feels like it needs something after it. So I like add the please, excuse me, please, because um, it feels like it needs more. Um, 
instead of referring to someone's like the woman over there needs help, you can say the patron instructor. Um, I put patron in there twice. Um, the child over there needs help. Uh, there's other ways you can use to identify people instead of using gender. This is another one. Instead of using maybe skin color, um, you can you you can say you know just the the person over there needs help. Um, and instead of saying good morning, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, everyone. Um, other things are uh, instead of saying thank you, sir, thank you very much. Um, when you're trying to indicate somebody and you don't want to you know refer to uh, their gender or like I was saying, their skin color or race, you could say person in the blue shirt, person with blonde hair, a person standing by the window. There's lots of other ways that we can identify people without having to fall back on these other words. I lost my notes. So here is how to greet people while I find my place in my notes again. It's really simple. If it's a boy, hi all, nice to be here. If it's a girl, hi all, nice to be here. If they're non-binary, hi all, nice to be here. It works for everyone. You're never going to go wrong doing that. So here's some additional examples. Instead of chairman or chairwoman, you can use chair chairperson. True story. I was previously uh, the chair of uh, NOLA ILC. And before, this was before I came out as trans and I referred to myself as the chair instead of the chairwoman. I would refer to myself as the chair or the chairperson of the board um, because I, I knew who I was. But I just wasn't ready to tell anybody yet. Um, instead of Fireman, policeman, mailman, we could say firefighter, police officer, mail carrier, um, manpower, man the reference desk. This is one that bugs me. Oh, um, staff, staffing, staff the reference desk. Um, husband or wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, spouse, partner, significant other, father, mother, grandmother, grandfather, um, brother, sister, parent, grandparents, siblings, um, men, women, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Y'all, people, everyone, everybody, folks, colleagues, comrades, crew, every pony, beloved friends and tolerated acquaintances, mateys, little meow meow, discerning guests, and those of you with nothing else to do on a Friday morning. Um, now, I want to say that we're not getting rid of gendered words. There are people who, you know, say, you know, I'm, but I'm not a spouse. I'm a husband. I'm a wife. Um, I'm not a parent. I'm a mother. And that is okay. That is an identity that that person um, takes for themselves. They claim for themselves, and that is fine. That is good. They should do that if that's how they want to identify. Um, it's just we're using this non-gendered language until we know more about the individual. Once we know more about that individual, we can start using that gendered language. This is just until we until we learn what they want to be called. We're not getting rid of an ungendered language. So about singular that. And this is a really, I really love this scene in Our Flag Means Death. Here we see Frenchie talking about Jim and saying, but Jim's the kind of person where if they stabbed me, I'd be like, yeah, probably deserved it. Um, because Jim's a badass. And uh, just Frenchie, everybody just sort of falls into when they, when they realize that Jim is non-binary and uses they, them pronouns, they just fall into using they, them pronouns for Jim. It says, where if they stabbed me, I'd be like, yeah, probably deserved it. I love that. Just a really great example of using they, them pronouns. Um, I hope that if I ever stab anyone, the person's like, yeah, I deserve that. Um, so use singular they for those people whose pronouns you don't know and for people who use they, them pronouns. Um, feel empowered to ask others what their pronouns are, but offer yours first. I get asked my pronouns all the time um, and they don't ask anybody else in the group what their pronouns are. There's like, oh, let me, what, what are your pronouns? And I tell them, and I'm, I'm glad they asked. It's, it's nice that they asked, but they don't ask anybody else. And it's like they've sent up a flare saying, oh, there's a trans right here. Oh, that's a trans person right there. Um, and I know they mean well, but the way that you can, to make somebody feel really comfortable is say, my pronouns are they, he, what are your pronouns? And ask everyone what their pronouns are. Um, a trans or non-binary person's pronouns are not their preferred pronouns. The pronouns they use are their pronouns. That's it. Those are their pronouns. And we want to get comfortable with singular they. It's not new. It's been going on for a really long time. The Oxford English Dictionary traces use of singular they 
to refer to an unnamed person back to the medieval romance William and the Werewolf in 1375. And that's that's like old English, but in modern English, it's each man hurried till they drew near, which does not agree in number, but it's right there. It, it's been going on for a while. Um, this we've got an example from the Wycliffe Bible. Um, each one in their craft is wise. Um, 1382, uh, just a few years after, just seven years after. Um, here's one from Pilgrimage of Perfection by William Bond. If a psalm scape any person or a lesson or if L or else if they omit one verse or twain. Here's some more examples, some, some more recent examples um, from History of Tom Jones, a foundling upon which everybody fell a laughing. How could they help it? Um, this, I really like this one. This is Emily Dickinson. Um, she just went wild. This was a, a letter she wrote. Almost anyone under the circumstances would have doubted if the letter were theirs or if indeed if they were themselves, but to, but to us, it was clear. She, was, she wasn't even saying themselves. She was saying themselves. Love that for her. Um, a person can't help their birth uh, in Vanity Fair. Uh, nobody in their senses would give sixpence on the strength of a promissory note of the kind. Um, that was Lord Lansdowne in 1910 um, in the liberal magazine and not that kind of liberal, the other kind of liberal. Um, she kept her head and kicked her shoes off as everybody ought to do who falls into deep water in their clothes. C.S. C. Lewis in Voyage of the Dawn Treader. And if it's good enough for Clive Staples and Emily Dickinson, I think that it's good enough for us. Now, I know some of you are still internally screaming, grammar, but grammar. So what about grammar? Um, the major style guides, they all agree, respect people's pronouns. If people use they, them pronouns, use they, them pronouns for them. AP is a little bit shiftier, but they do say not to misgender someone by assigning an incorrect pronoun to them. So that's something they've come out with. AP has come out with a little more um, recently. And I've just, but um, they just say don't. If they, if they use they, them pronouns, make sure you know, make sure that your audience knows that you're referring to a singular person. And what about informal writing? Um, it's always gonna be okay in informal writing. Informal writing, singular they is always going to be fine for people who use they, them pronouns, even informal writing. If, um, it's, if it's, you're not writing for somebody who, if the gender isn't known about the person, um, reword. Um, just reword for agreement and number and formal writing. But if the writer knows the person referred to uses they, them personal pronouns, then the gender is known and should be respected by they, them, even in formal writing. Um, I do, somebody asked me last time I gave this presentation, what about neo pronouns? It would be the same thing. Use neo pronouns. If somebody uses neo pronouns, um, that those would be grammatically correct too. Um, uh, the Chicago Manual of Style says, uh, doesn't, doesn't even prohibit singular they as a substitute for generic he. It says it's better to reword for agreement and number, but singular they is better than generic he. Um, AP style book, again, it says that, you know, it's best to reword, it should agree in number, but it says in limited cases, it's okay if it's overly awkward or clumsy, uh, you can go ahead and use singular they. And just, it's usually, it's, it's just gonna be, you just have to think about it for a second and just reword. So instead of each student is expected to choose their topic, which does not agree, um, reword for students are expected to choose their topic or each student is expected to choose a topic. That's simple. Then you don't have to worry about it. So what do you do when you get it wrong? Because you will get it wrong. I know we're, I know we're coming up on time and I'm almost done, I promise. So um, here's a little gift I made. It says, I've, it's been days since I've misgendered myself. Oop, no, there we go. Damn. Um, and I posted this to Twitter and all my little trans fan friends just freaked out and laughed because we are always trans, we're always misgendering ourselves. And if I can't get it right all the time, you were definitely not going to get it right all the time. So it is a win. You get it wrong, not an if. And it's going to be okay. I promise. So you just served the man. Um, and here, I really like this. This is Olawande um, talking to someone and saying, oh, I'm sure it's just a formality. Oh, oh no, 
it's 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 not a formality sorry and it is not a formality to try to get someone's pronouns right and try over and over again no matter how many mistakes you make you're going to make a mistake it happens to everyone it takes time to adjust to new ways of speaking and thinking but it's going to be all right what are you supposed to do when you get it wrong don't go on about how sorry you are that will only make the person you just misgendered feel more awkward or even that they have to comfort you um, don't center yourself or your feelings about misgendering the other person. Don't make it about you. Apologize and move on. Don't give up. Using correct pronouns is not optional, but do keep trying. So what if the person I just misgendered gets really, really angry? Um, I, I, this, this slide is titled in my notes, Trans Anger. Most people are going to be cool. Some are going to be angry. It's just what's going to happen. If they don't accept your apology, if they don't realize your mistake was made in good faith, don't go on about how sorry you are. Do not try to explain why you made the mistake. Saying things like, I'm sorry, it's just that you really look like a man. My mistake, or I'm sorry, you just have a really feminine voice, will only make it worse. Do not do that. Just apologize again. And if they don't accept your apology, move on. Try to empathize and meet the other person with compassion and understanding. But why can't they just accept your apology? You want them to accept your apology. You're doing your best. You're trying so hard. And you want them to understand that. You want them to, to accept that apology from you. Remember the slides at the beginning? Things are rough out there for trans youth. Things are rough out there for all of us right now. And things are especially rough out there for trans youth. You might not be the first person to misgender that person today. You might not be the 10th. Um, trans folks are constantly being misgendered, often maliciously. Um, it can be difficult to tell when someone is a friend or a foe. It can be difficult to tell if it's a genuine mistake. Uh, their anger or resentment likely has nothing to do with you. Um, it's a result of feeling always under attack. My default is to be wary of others until they've proven they'll treat me with respect, which may seem unfair to all the cis allies, but wariness is how we as trans people keep ourselves safe remember it's not about you as an individual or your intent don't center yourself or your feelings try to empathize and imagine why they are reacting so strongly just do better next time so here's some links to support for trans people in crisis all of these are going to be in uh with the qr code and the website that i'm going to share at the end And uh, here's, here's the, the URL, here is the QR code. Um, if you would like to get in touch with me, again, my name is Daniel DuPont. Um, I work at Delgado, here is my work email. You are welcome to get in touch with me there. But if you would like to speak privately about gender identity on an email service that is not owned by our employers, there is my personal email address and you are welcome to contact me there. If you know someone who has questions about gender identity, um, their own, their child's gender identity, their, um, their niece, nephew's gender identity, you are welcome to share that email address with them as well. All of these uh, slides will be at that URL along with all the resources, all of the, the references I mentioned. Um, and that's it, that's all for me. Thank you very much. Hey, Danielle, thank you so much, um, because as you said at the very beginning, oh, here, let me put on my video, too, so you can see me. Come on. Um, you know, every time you present this, you are um, coming out, and that's a lot. So I really think thank you. It was very, and I really love the our flag means death, um, give along. Um, but let me move on and just check um, in the Q&A session of the session, if we've gotten any questions, Caitlin, um, or even if you want to repeat, we've gotten a lot of compliments for both of our presenters today. Um, Caitlin, do you have some to, to say? No questions in the chat just yet, um, but everyone feel free to put those in and I will read them out. Or if you'd like to unmute, you can feel free to do that. A um, lot of good discussion going on in the chat though. We were talking about how nicely gender neutral the word y'all is. And we have the benefit of living in the South where that's used. And I know there's at least a couple of us who 
discussed how we used to overuse the phrase you guys, but have replaced it with y'all. Um, y'all means see. all. Y'all means all, indeed. And I really like, I, I started following hockey not, not long ago, and um, my team is the Pittsburgh Penguins, and they have a term yins, mm -hmm. which makes no sense to me, but I think it's kind of like they're y'all. Yeah, yeah. Pennsylvania has some weird, weird dialect things going on, but I like that too. Uh, one question that did just come in, in the chat for Emily, can you tell us more about Nearpod? Is it a free service? Yeah, I think that worked really well and we're all interested to know more about it. Right, so uh, Nearpod can be free. Um, the free version, you can only have up to uh, 40 participants log in and not every single type of activity is available. So like um, drag and drop where you can like drag an image over another image and drop it into a column to sort of like match things like that's not available. Um, but for the most part, it, it works really well under the free sort of version, um, more so than say Kahoot, which only allows not, like 10 participants at a time. Uh, so I found Nearpod's free version to be best, yeah. Excellent, thank you. I think a lot of us are really eager to try that out after seeing how you used it so successfully. Yes, I wanna I... address, oh, 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 I'm sorry, go ahead. Um. Well, you know, if you had more to say about Nearpod, I was going to swerve to something else, but go ahead if you wanted to. Um, well, there was a, a comment about that they use Pear Deck, um, but it it was making Google Slides interactive, and but there was no free version. So this is always good to learn new technologies. But um, I'm sorry. So back to you, Danny. So I think I think you, Alicia, said something about. Um, Sometimes it feels informal, too informal just to say the person's first name if you're addressing an email, something like that. I also feel that way. So I'll say like, good morning, good afternoon, hello in an email. Um, but I always sign my emails with my first name. And so I can kind of give that uh, clue to somebody that they are, they're they welcome to use my first name. And then I take my clues from the person. Sometimes people will sign their name, you know, like Mrs. Whoever. Well, then I know that that's how they want me to address them. But then if they sign their emails with their first name, then I know it's okay. Um, and so I try to like maybe give the, those uh, signals out to people um, and then just try to follow their lead. Excellent. And true, that's the same, uh, you know, I do, I tend to give that permission um, unless it's, uh, I did have um, at one point that we were working um, with the U.S. Wildlife and Fisheries and the Coast Guard was coming to present. And I would, uh, like every time, they were always like Lieutenant, Captain, whatever, so in first and last name. So I was like, I will address you as that because that is how you are addressed in, as you said too, even your formal um, possible email for your workplace versus in a private or conversational uh, situation. Excellent point. I, I will actually refer to people by their working title. So librarian DuPont or administrator so-and-so or professor. And then the, the lifesaver is always doctor because it has no gender. Um, so those are, I think, some other options too that you can use. It might look a little weird, but it's a way to sort of keep that formal tone while skirting around the Mr. Mrs. Uh, situation. I love, I love the doctor thing. I love that. Um, I was, when I was teaching at LSU, all the students would call me doctor or professor. And I wasn't a doctor or a professor and I would like correct them, but then they didn't know what to call me. And I was like, you could just call me by my first name, I guess. Um, but now I've been, I'm now an assistant professor. And I'm like, technically you can call me professor now. <laughs> technically we can do that. Uh, there you go. There you go. And and Danny, I almost put my mic on so that you could hear me giggling at your little jokes and stuff, but then I didn't want to interrupt or in case I was interrupted. But um, yeah, this yes. is my first time doing this um, like remotely. I usually like can see people and see right. them respond to me. And so it was weird because I, I, as you can tell, I'm, I do little yes, jokes. Things. I, I know. I'm, I'm, and I think that's the thing. It is it is often difficult when you're doing these remote presentations, 
for all of us because oftentimes they don't even let you see, uh, at least we get to see all these names and, and such. They don't even let you see that. Um, so it, it can feel like, am I falling flat? Is this not going over well? Um, it, it is a it is a totally different way of presenting than in person, but it's good for us to practice all versions. And I really appreciate both you and Emily presenting today. I want to remind everyone that we have um, social media chat channels on our link tree, which um, Caitlin, uh, if you can drop again into the chat. And that also includes on our link tree, um, that land acknowledgement and call to action statement, um, the evaluation form for um, this presentations today or any other comments and such, they have space if you would like to include for the entire conference for those of you who have been able to attend multiple days. And finally, eventually we will have these presentations posted on YouTube. You will receive an email but um, we are going to do, um, which we didn't get to hear you, Danny, on Friday, I mean, on Monday night, but we are going to check in YouTube to make sure that we have all the closed captionings correct um, so that those who um, need that will um, be able to follow along with our videos once we've posted them. Oh, and look, we've got the HOMA petition was signed by someone. Uh, excellent. I haven't had chance, but that was on my list. Um, and if you guys are interested, you know, our YouTube channel, it will be in the email we provide. Thank you, everyone, for your attendance. And if you want to contact us, it's nolailc at gmail.com. Couldn't be easier. Oh, and thank you um, uh, and for presenting as well the other uh, uh, day. All right. Um, that's really all I have, uh, unless anyone wants to just hang and chat. But I appreciate all of you for your attendance, for your information, as well as um, your openness to hear all different, different topics that we covered this week. I'll say goodbye. Thanks, everyone. You're welcome. Did anyone have questions who's still on? Oops, no, <laughs> bye. Okay, I just, I, I always hate to um, close it out in case someone was just hanging around just for a little personal touch. Goodbye, everyone. Take care. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.